Madam City Manager, do you have any comments for the council and the public this evening? Yes, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, I do have about a three or four minute presentation um, providing an update to council and the community on our reimagining public safety process. So on July 14th, council adopted an omnibus package, um, as we all know, to reimagine public safety and policing in the city of Berkeley. This is a very important city council referral and I'd like to offer you and the community an update on the status of that referral along with my intention to provide regular updates at city council meetings to the best of my ability. Um, the omnibus package consisted of numerous elements. Um, but they weren't limited to um, the few that I'm going to go over and I'll do this in brief detail. Um, one was having the city auditor perform an analysis, as you're all aware. Um, secondly, analyzing and developing a pilot program to reassign non-criminal police service calls to a specialized care unit. Um, also creating plans and protocols for calls for service to be routed and assigned to alternative preferred responding entities and to consider placing dispatch in the fire department or elsewhere outside the police department. Also analyzing litigation outcomes and exposure for city departments in order to guide the creation of city policy to reduce the impact of settlements. I'm losing my train of thought here, one, one second. And um, also engaging a qualified firm or individuals to lead a robust and inclusive and transparent community engagement process with the goal of achieving a new and transformative model of positive, equitable, and community-centered safety for Berkeley. Also pursuing the creation of a Berkeley Department of Transportation, BERCDOT, to ensure a racial justice lens in traffic enforcement and the development of transportation policy programs and infrastructure and identify and implement approaches to reduce and or eliminate the practice of pretextual stops based on minor um, traffic violations. Subsequent to the adoption of that omnibus package, the city established a multi-department working group. This group will oversee and implement various components of the package and the working, group, the working group consists of me, the, our deputy city managers, Paul and Dave, our city attorney, our fire chief, the HR director, police chief, and the public works director. We've established weekly meetings and have developed an organizational structure that will enable us to advance the various referrals in the omnibus package at the same time. Our work to advance the omnibus package has been organized in the following manner. Our HHCS director, Lisa Farhus, will be leading the work to develop a specialized care unit pilot program. Fire Chief Dave Brannigan will lead the work to develop a plan for priority dispatching. City Attorney Farima Brown will manage the analysis of litigation claims and settlements. Mm. And the police reimagining and community engagement process will be led by Deputy City Manager David White. He will also be supporting me by providing overall project management to support the full team. BERCDOT will be led by our Public Works Director, Liam Garland. And our initial work so far has been focused on assigning roles and responsibilities, vetting the omnibus package adopted by Council and clarifying the work and developing project work plans. The following information that I'll share will provide some information on for the city council and the community on this important assignment. So for the city auditor, calls for service and budget analysis. City staff have participated in an entrance meeting with the city auditor, and we've started to provide the city auditor with the data that the auditor's office has requested. The police department has provided the city auditor with calls for service data from 2012 to 2018, mm -hmm. and is working to develop the 2019 data set. In addition, the police department has provided the city auditor with various policies and other background information that will be helpful to her and her team in performing the work requested by the council. It is currently anticipated that the city auditor will have a classification of calls for service data available by February 2021. This data will help to inform the police reimagining process. On to our specialized care unit. We drafted a project plan that defines the assignment, the final work product, key questions that will be answered, key milestones and deliverables, 
a project timeline, resource needs, and a city staff team that will be devoted, devoted to this work. Um, Dr. Watt Varhus has met with the Mental Health Commission and other stakeholders to discuss the assignment and has received important feedback that will shape a steering committee to work with staff and inform a deep community engagement process. Also for this specialized care unit, a consultant has been selected to lead this work and the team is working to refine the scope of work to be able to bring a recommendation forward to City Council in December of 2020. The consultant that is selected will, will not only be helping the city develop a pilot specialized care unit, but also take a deep look into how the city responds to mental health calls. Now, as for priority dispatching, we drafted a project plan that outlines key questions that need to be addressed. Again, here a timeline, resource needs, internal working group, key stakeholders, and community engagement. To date, the fire department has convened focus, group with employee, focus groups with employees in the fire department and dispatch to solicit input and feedback. In developing the project plan, the fire chief has determined that resources estimated at $83,000 will be needed to pay for the overtime of staff assigned to this project, community engagement, and hiring a third-party consultant to assist in designing the dispatch system. Lastly, um, analysis of litigation claims and settlements. The city attorney is working with her team to develop a data set that consists of all of the litigation claims and settlements over the past 10 years. This data will inform the basis for her work. In evaluating the referral more closely, the city attorney has estimated that she will need resources estimated at 25,000 to engage subject matter experts. This request will be incorporated into the November AAO. On reimagining and community, police reimagining and the community engagement process, as you all are aware, a request for proposal was developed and issued on September 8th. A pre-bid conference was held on the 15th of September, and we've received responses back that were due on Tuesday, October 6th. To date, we've received six proposals. The city has put together a team consisting of city staff, community, and other stakeholders to evaluate and review the proposals that were submitted to the city. The purpose of the review is to determine the extent to which the proposals are responsive to the evaluation criteria outlined in the RFP firms and to determine the firm and or individuals that will advance to an interview. The review team will also be responsible for performing interviews of those firms and indiv individuals that submitted proposals that are deemed to be most responsive and qualified. It is anticipated that the proposal review process will occur during the months of October and a portion of November 2020, and a recommendation to City Council will be on the City Council agenda once the review process is complete. This time is a bit more lengthy than originally anticipated by us, but um, the result of, of providing firms and their individuals more time um, to respond to the RFP and, and, and to have a more inclusive review process. So it's taking just a little longer. For BurkDOT, we've also convened inter interdepartmental BurkDOT project team that is meeting every two weeks. They've drafted a project plan that involves taking a look at other cities, best practices, and eliciting our community commissions and council's input. We've initiated legal research on state law implications on BurkDOT, and in evaluating the scope of the referral, it has also been determined that resources estimated at $75,000 will be needed to solicit outside resources to help perform best practice research. At this time, I just wanna thank council for their, their vision and their work in pulling together this information. I will continue to provide updates at each council meeting. They probably won't be as lengthy as this evening, but um, we will provide an update at each council meeting. Mr. Mayor, thank you for your leadership. And is there anything that you would like to add? I'd like to yield to you if you'd like to add anything further to this update. Um, I'm gonna ask that council members direct their questions to the city manager uh, individually, we do need to move on in the interest of time, as we have several items. We have, uh, we have 85 attendees that have been waiting to address. One thing I will say is we are working with the city manager um, to recommend a process for the um, the Berkeley Community Safety Coalition Steering Committee and the, the community process and hope to be able to report on that at a future city council meeting. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the information that I just shared, I will make that available in writing. Thank you. Excellent. Th and maybe in the form of, of an off agenda memo, um, so we could share that with the community would be greatly appreciated. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Council's back in session. We'll now go to item 19. This is the 2019 crime report and five year use of force report. And Madam City Manager, um, thank I'll you, Mr. Turn the floor over to you and Chief Greenwood. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will be turning over the presentation to the Chief. Also joining him this evening um, will be staff to give a presentation on overtime. So, Chief. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and uh, council members. I'm going to uh, put up a PowerPoint here and we will get started. <clears throat> And you should see the first slide. Can someone just let me know that's good? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. <clears throat> All right, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, I'm Andrew Greenwood, the Chief of Police. And joining me for this presentation is our department's Fiscal Administrative Services Manager, Chuck Gunter. Uh, tonight, we'll be reporting on crime in 2019. Crime in 2020 through August, as compared to August of 2019, and uh, considering the pandemic overlay. And then we'll also review uh, the first annual use of force report, which covers force used and reported in the past five years. And finally, we'll present information on overtime expenditures last year and this year. Uh, my thought is that uh, there's sort of three parts of the report and we can answer questions between each section. Um, and we'll be uh, happy to do that. Uh, so with that, <clears throat> we'll get underway. We report on specific crimes as defined in the Federal Uniform Crime Report Standards, or UCR standards, we'll look at part one UCR crimes, including property crimes of burglary, larceny, including petty theft, grand theft, and auto burglary, auto theft, and arson, and the part one violent crimes, murder, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault. This first graphic shows uh, 2019 as compared to 2018. Uh, in 2019, total part one crime increased by 15.6% overall. Part one violent crime increased by 3.2%, about 19 incidents. But part one property crimes increased by 17%, representing 921 crimes. Uh, as in 2018, there were no homicides in 2019. There were slight increases in rape, robbery, and aggravated assault, uh, with large increases in larcenies, including auto burglaries and petty and grand thefts. On this chart, which is sort of color coded, you can see that on the right, uh, the larceny represented in orange uh, went up significantly in 2019 as compared to 2018. <clears throat> and this is a five year look at total part one crimes. Um, uh, just over the past five years, to give a little bit of context, as you can see, 2019, here the larcenies are in green, uh, is a visible uh, increase compared to other years. This is total part one property crimes in the past five years uh, with burglaries decreasing by 5.2% um, with 788 reports compared to 831 reported in 2018. Residential burglaries were down by 19.6% while commercial burglaries increased by 23.8% in 2019. Larcenies, various kinds of thefts, increased by 25% to 5,029 cases as compared to 4,007 in 2018. The larceny figures include auto burglary, which increased 42% from 1,739 cases in 2018 to 2,473 cases in 2019. And auto thefts decreased 9.3% from 548 to 497 in 2019. In 2019, part one violent crimes tracked pretty closely with 2018 with uh, just minor variances. In 2019, robberies increased by 2.5% with an increase of 11 cases. Pedestrian robberies increased and commercial robberies decreased. Laptop thefts and robberies continue to be a problem uh, in, uh, in 2019. Um, the red bar there represents commercial robberies. And I just want to point out that uh, commercial robberies can be somewhat misleading. Most of these are actually sort of shoplifting incidents gone wrong. 
That is to say, a shoplifting can become a robbery when there's a confrontation between the suspect and, for example, a security guard or a store employee. And if, um, if, there's a, if there's a use of force or fear during that confrontation, it becomes a technical robbery. So, um, and that's about 90% of our commercial robberies are actually these shoplifting incidents. So um, uh, about 10% of them are actually um, where there's a, a business, a commercial business is open uh, and it is uh, robbed by somebody who comes into the business um, uh, expressly to rob it rather than to commit a shoplifting. So um, the commercial uh, burglaries there are, excuse me, the commercial robberies that uh, can be somewhat misleading that way. Uh, and I wanted to show uh, 2020 year to date and sort of talk a little about crime during COVID. Here we see that the part one crime, total part one crime, uh, January through August 2019 compared to 2020. Uh, total part one crime was down 1%. Uh, part one violent crime decreased by uh, 6%. And part one overall property crimes is nearly identical. Uh, and although the shelter in place from COVID had an impact in March and April, when far fewer people were outside uh, and calls for service and crimes dropped significantly, we are now seeing um, uh, a, an increased level of part one crimes uh, so that um, we are actually about even with, uh, with last year. So the initial decrease in crime that we saw as a result of the shelter in place um, uh, is now um, gone and we are back up to the level of crimes that we were before. This is the total part one violent crimes uh, year to date from 2019 to 2020. Uh, although uh, violent crimes are down overall with reductions in robbery and rape, but aggravated assaults are up uh, and this would include shootings. Uh, this year we've had four homicides, unfortunately. Uh, the January 20th homicide of Bernadette Young Bear at Sixteen University, the March 21st homicide of Deontay Craig near uh, uh, Chestnut University, the June 15th homicide of Seth Smith on Dwight Way, and the September 26th homicide of Alfred Taylor on Glen Street. All of these cases have been now closed by arrest with the suspect safely taken into custody and charged in these cases. In 2020, robberies are down about 16% compared to 2019. Pedestrian robberies were down sharply during the initial shelter order, but have started to rise over the summer as more and more people are out. Aggravated assaults are up 27% with 20 more reports thus far. And as of August, there were 21 confirmed shooting incidents through the first eight months of 2020, uh, with eight arrests made and several more investigations ongoing. Uh, as, uh, as many of you are aware, um, we have had uh, several more shootings um, and uh, with a couple of arrests made um, in, in uh, September, October, uh, and several investigations ongoing in those cases. Uh, overall rapes are down 20% with 33 reports compared to 42 last year, and none of those were classified as, uh, as stranger, uh, stranger attacks uh, up, up through the end of August. Looking now at total part one property crimes year to date, the property crimes are about even, but there are some changes uh, within those numbers. Uh, while auto burglaries have gone down, catalytic converter thefts have gone up significantly, and increases in auto thefts have gone up in Berkeley and are being experienced similarly in jurisdictions across the region. Um, COVID has really impacted our efforts to impact uh, property crimes through arrest of repeat offenders of nonviolent crimes, uh, which, uh, as you can see, consists of thousands of offenses every year in Berkeley. Uh, since March, due to COVID-19 concerns, um, uh, all nonviolent offenders have been released on citations. Uh, for example, nearly every one of the people we've arrested for being in possession of a stolen auto, uh, catalytic converter thieves, uh, and um, nonviolent property crimes uh, have, has received a citation and not been held in custody uh, unless they have some other pending, generally a, a felony. So um, it has been challenging in the sense of bringing uh, accountability, especially for those folks who are uh, serial offenders in the uh, sort of property crime category. Uh, and this has been a challenge. Uh, it's also uh, been a challenge with the zero bail schedule in that our investigators will conduct investigations and prepare uh, what are called Ramey warrants or arrest warrants. And that is part of an, part, that's an investigatory step, which uh, when the person is arrested on that warrant, allows the investigator to uh, interview them, to gather more information and to work on a case. <clears throat> However, now the Ramey warrants are often set at one penny, 
So an arrest is made, but the person is immediately cited out, which denies the investigator the opportunity to talk to the suspect to pot potentially gather more uh, information for their investigation. So that has been problematic for our property crimes investigators uh, in doing their work, uh, especially given that we uh, do see that we have uh, a small number, but we have a serial repeat offenders uh, who victimize our community. And uh, those are the folks that we really want to impact through our investigations um, to get those cases closed on them. Uh, so uh, I'm just sharing this challenge uh, because our community is affected by it uh, and suffers from uh, the high amounts of, uh, of property crime. And um, I just wanted to share that uh, that is one of our frustrations uh, in terms of uh, policing um, in the amidst sort of the COVID challenge. I uh, just want to show you a couple of uh, slides here showing uh, crime pre-COVID and after. Um, this first slide is the first two months of 2020 pre-COVID. And the uh, remarkable pieces really to see are that uh, uh, robberies, which is the third column, were up significantly from, uh, this is compared to year to date, the first two months of the year. So robberies were already up uh, by uh, 23, or I'm sorry, 18, um, 17 or 18 events. Um, and that third set of uh, columns and then larcenies uh, were greatly increased um, and aggravated assaults were up significantly as well. Um, so they really, the year started off trending upward. And if you think back to uh, the first slide showing that we had an increase in larcenies, uh, which really drove the, the uh, crime up in 2019 compared to 2018, uh, this is alarming because we started the year um, sharply up in those concerning categories. However, during uh, COVID, March through August, there were some changes. Um, robberies dropped significantly. So if you look at the, the robbery column, the third set of bar graphs, um, robberies dropped significantly compared to year to date last year from uh, 173, uh, 77 down to 123. Uh, the aggravated assaults were about even, uh, burglaries up a bit. Uh, larceny, as you can see, were really, had really dropped down. Um, however, auto theft, um, really, um, really went up uh, over 200 events. Uh, and we've just seen that um, uh, during sort of the COVID times and the shelter in place, um, people have uh, gone to stealing autos either to get around or to resell or resell for parts. And this has been a, a problem we've seen in the region. And this uh, final slide shows year to date um, and uh, larcenies are climbing back up. Auto thefts continue to be uh, uh, strong burglaries are uh, just slightly above last year. Our aggravated assaults are up as well. Uh, street robberies um, are down uh, slightly. Uh, and um, so COVID has, ha has had an effect. Our city population, keep in mind, has been, um, uh, has been reduced not only for significant, significant periods of time have we had people uh, not out and about, but with the University of California um, either closed or operating in a limited capacity We've um, not seen the uh, larger student population returning to town, and uh, that is um, uh, just a, a piece of the, of the COVID effect here. Um, in terms of the types of crimes, we've seen not only stolen autos uh, going up, but also the theft of catalytic converters. Uh, this is because they're easy to steal and they demand a lot of money um, from, a, from a fence. So uh, we've seen though that that uh, catalytic converter uh, theft is one of the things that's driving uh, larceny. And then um, in, uh, in sort of interesting development, our investigators are telling me that they are seeing um, through their interviews with uh, suspects that uh, there are um, unemployment, um, they're seeing increase in fraud from ADD from filing for unemployment. Employment. And this appears to be sort of a new popular crime arising um, just as identity theft has arisen too. Uh, it doesn't show up in a part one crime because it's not necessarily one of the uh, eight types of crimes, but um, it is a, um, uh, apparently a, a somewhat lucrative uh, endeavor uh, in terms of uh, crime. And some of our investigators think that people are, are focused on that sort of uh, crime to, um, to obtain money rather than the other crimes that we see. I did want to highlight a couple of uh, a couple of accomplishments and developments in the past uh, year and in 20 uh, and in this year. Uh, first off, uh, we have gone live uh, on October 1st with uh, the implementation of Survey123, which is software that allows us to uh, collect data 
uh, per the Racial Identity, I, I, Racial uh, Identity and Profiling Act, or REPA. Uh, this was a software solution that was developed in-house using software that the city's already licensed for through its uh, ArcGIS licensing. Uh, it's essentially a survey application that's been customized uh, so that uh, when you go through the application, you uh, have to uh, answer each field and the, uh, certain answers um, branch off into other, um, other required um, data elements. Uh, so uh, our staff um, put together the, uh, the software for this. It's deployed on our iPhones. Uh, we'll be submitting data one year ahead of uh, other agencies our size. Uh, we're one of four agencies ahead of the 400 agencies required to start submitting data after next year. So uh, we're happy to um, get this up uh, and um, up and uh, implemented. Uh, like I said, started October 1st. We're anticipating um, having information on the open data portal uh, in, um, in uh, early November. Uh, we just need to make sure that our data is flowing through properly. This slide shows uh, some of the rich aspects of this uh, REPA data um, where, uh, for example, there are many reasons potentially that an officer could show as a reason for a stop, multiple actions taken during the stop, um, if there's a search, the basis for the search, uh, and the result of the stop. So this will really give us um, the rich data um, to uh, consider, to analyze uh, in the not so distant future. Uh, we've talked about this uh, to some extent with the mayor's uh, fair and impartial working group, and we're happy to get this up and rolling so that we can get this richer data to give us a full understanding of our officers' work when they're doing car stops uh, and provide uh, better information for, um, for policy making. Uh, in the fall of uh, 2019, in October, uh, the police department formed the Downtown Telegraph Task Force, uh, which worked with our downtown community's input. Uh, they uh, let us know loud and clear that they um, really needed help uh, to focus on, in particular, the threatening and assaultive behavior, uh, behaviors that affected a, sort of a sense of safety for people moving about in the downtown and telegraph area. Our uh, downtown task force uh, made hundreds of uh, merchant contacts, uh, got to know the people in the area, and uh, set about doing their work um, uh, to bring that level of uh, increased level of safety uh, in the area. <clears throat> in 2020, we began acquiring the equipment uh, necessary to restart the Berkeley Police Bike Patrol or Bike Detail. Uh, this uh, involved purchasing bicycles, equipment, and tra uh, safety training. And um, we transitioned from the Downtown Telegraph Task Force into a return to our bike patrol. Uh, their first full day of this newly established team uh, was uh, September 22nd. Um, and it is uh, under the leadership of uh, Sergeant Kasalik. Uh, and uh, he has six officers who are um, now on bikes working the downtown and the telegraph area. Um, and they have been uh, very active uh, and we're happy to get them in the field. One of the themes that I wanted to strike here is that, um, you know, we serve our community in alignment with our community values. Um, and uh, there's a long legacy in Berkeley of being ahead, of being um, um, at the forefront of the profession and, um, and to a great extent, we find ourselves setting examples for others in the profession. Um, and to that end, other agencies are actively interested in how we are doing our work uh, and what they can learn from us. And so I just wanna to touch on three examples where our department members, their professionalism and their expertise have been sharing uh, our good work with other, uh, other agencies even across the country. Um, first off, uh, this is a screen grab from KPBS, which did a story on um, on our uh, department's de-escalation work. Uh, the department's formal focus on de-escalation as a tactic has brought attention from across the country, uh, including from the Minnesota State Police in June following the killing of George Floyd. Uh, Lieutenant Spencer Fomby has been a spokesperson for how de-escalation uh, has been and can be successfully used in law enforcement. And this recent story was carried on KPBS uh, this past June. As law enforcement agencies look for examples of the police working with mental health professionals to serve those in mental health crises, uh, they'd look to Berkeley. The California Chiefs Training Conference invited Berkeley Police Department and Berkeley Mobile Crisis to present at their uh, annual training conference a few weeks ago. A mobile crisis team member, Dr. Jen Widrow, 
uh, Sergeant Ronnie Rodriguez and Acting Captain Kevin Schofield did a presentation for the conference this year on developing this non-law enforcement program in response to individuals in mental health crisis. Uh, chiefs are very interested in how to move to this sort of uh, program. Uh, so in the presentation, they, our people provided a history of the program, which started in 1979 with the goal to divert people away from the criminal justice system while serving them. Uh, and uh, they presented on how the various components come together to provide services for those in the community. And our mobile crisis program is of tremendous interest to agencies who are now working on their own to figure out how they can incorporate these approaches. And of course, this discussion is uh, clearly going to uh, follow on with the work that the city managers talked about in the uh, reimagining policing uh, and the um, uh, working on uh, alternatives to uh, police involvement with uh, mental health issues. In addition, uh, Lieutenant Dan Montgomery presented a few weeks ago at the California Chiefs Conference in a panel called Creating the Next Generation of Leaders. Um, Lieutenant Montgomery oversees the Inner Perspectives Program, which is a regional leadership and development class for line level officers. Uh, this program has proven immensely popular and several of our newer sergeants went through this class as officers. So he was sharing with uh, the California chiefs um, how the line level officers doing the work in the Inner Perspectives uh, actively work to uh, discuss and uh, to discuss the issues facing our profession from officers wellness to building personal resilience in our work, exploring ethical leadership and examining in depth how race and gender uh, impact officers careers, relationships and the role of police legitimacy in police community relationships. Uh, this work develops perspective and understanding I think in our line level officers and prepares them to take on leadership decisions and responsibilities. And of course, we're all looking forward to a post COVID world. Um, I, I, uh, one, of, uh, one of, there was a comment earlier tonight that we're, we're months away still, but um, I, I do wanna communicate. I think I speak for everyone in the department uh, when I say that we miss the opportunities to engage at all the events that we've become so accustomed to seeing people in a non-enforcement mode from the Solano stroll to the 4th of July, the kite festival, Juneteenth and our monthly coffee with the cop events. Uh, we do miss these events. They give us the opportunity to connect with our community members, you know, in person, uh, in a non-enforcement mode, and, and our staff greatly misses them. So we look forward to that. Uh, last week, we tried out a sort of virtual coffee with a cop, and we're going to keep looking at ways we can connect and engage uh, safely um, while we uh, deal with uh, the requirements of COVID. And with that, I'd be glad to answer questions regarding uh, the first part of the report here. Thank you. So we'll take questions in the first part of the report. Um, and I'm going to um, invoke the two minute rules. So if we can um, clerk in time two minutes. And first Councilmember is Councilmember Robinson. Hey, Chief, how you doing? I'm well. Thank you for the uh, the depth of the report. Good to see you and the uh, and the presentation and congrats on the uh, the repo launch. I saw the update from that just a bit ago, and I know we've been building up to that for a long time. That that screenshot is the first I've seen of the interface. It uh, looks pretty slick. Um, and I should note, of course, uh, my my appreciation for the the downtown Telegraph task force. I know the uh, the bikes are out there recently. I've seen them myself, and that's a, an important and exciting approach from years ago. That I know that the merchants are deeply grateful to have back. Uh, I have a one very specific and then one very conceptual question. Uh, you know, every time I, um, you know, I, I see that line that we, you know, we didn't have any homicides in 2019, I, I more or less know what we're saying, but the, the first thought I have uh, is knowing that many in our community may, may read that and be confused because they know that it's not true. Uh, there was the, the shooting at People's Park uh, as a, an individual named Cal, who we, who we lost in April 2019. Uh, and just for our benefit, so we understand the numbers we're looking at here and the, the structure of the report, my presumption is that that's omitted either because UCPD was the responding party or because it took place on campus property. That's one of the other, presumably. That's correct. It occurred on campus property, so it's in their jurisdiction uh, and is gotcha. their report. So, uh, so of course, as a matter of fact, we of course responded and were part of the response. Uh, that suspect was taken in custody, I believe, a day later and had actually committed right. self abuse. So it's, right, it's, yeah, uh, a string of shootings really is Yeah, I'm terrifying. certainly not trying to uh, hide or conceal anything. It's a matter of what 
what we're responsible for. Certainly, yeah, and I, I know that well. Uh, I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, the sentence, there were no homicides in Berkeley in 2019 can lead misreadingly uh, if you don't, if you're not thinking about that, that jurisdictional question. Uh, a related element there, uh, you know, are there numbers from UCPD as well that it would be valuable for us to see sort of in the context of these numbers that we're seeing? Uh, and you know, I'm curious really if, if they've noticed you know, similar trends in, in upticks of uh, any reports that they're getting uh, you know, in, in positive or negative directions to, to what BPD is seeing. Yeah, I have not had in-depth discussions with Chief Bennett. I think they've had less activity because their university has been shut down uh, so significantly. Uh, so I don't have particular information on that. Um, but um, just given the fact that the, the school property is shut down so much and that probably 20 or 30,000 people are not here who normally are, I would Literally, yeah. really have much less. In the same thread, um, yeah, I, I'm sure it's, it's something that's, that's on your mind every day, but uh, we haven't had uh, that much of an opportunity, at least in the report, to, to think too much about the, the causes for any of the strange trends we've seen you know, this year in particular. I think there's a, you know, a few numbers that I imagine will, will jump out to, to anyone that lives in the city, you know, knowing that aggravated assaults are up 17%, I mean, auto, th auto thefts being up as, as much as 66 uh, I just totally, I, I imagine it's, it's largely speculative at this point, but do we, do we imagine much of that is tied mostly just to the, the lack of eyes on the street? Or are we, are we noticing or able to tell if it's a, it's a result of you know, elements of a, a life under shelter in place, economic desperation, consequences of a, you know, the, the state of the economy and, and job losses? I mean, to what extent are we able to speculate uh, causes for, for any of these trends? Uh, I'm pretty cautious about speculating on causes, but, um, but the developments are, to me, the developments, for example, about the theft of catalytic converters uh, mm -hmm. and auto theft. So what we see are people who um, are, um, uh, are you know, stealing cars, doing that rapid removal of a, of a catalytic converter because they can get hundreds of dollars for it. So it's got a high value. So um, over time, things have high value. It used to be CDs like 15, 20 years ago, auto burglaries and CDs, because people could walk right into, right into a local used record place with a CD in the case and get money for it, like right there. Right. Um, this is, uh, catalytic converters represent uh, um, a high value. Um, stealing a car can represent a fairly high value uh, how, for whatever reason. Uh, and also the consequence for doing it right now is, is in a sense, almost zero. So, uh, right. We have, you know, we, uh, I believe, mm, now I believe about two weeks ago, we had an officer spot at like three in the morning, I believe in West Berkeley, uh, two guys taking a catalytic converter. Uh, you know, he, he came around on them, they got in the car, they left, but they pulled over, stopped, and they had, I believe they had three catalytic converters, you know, in their, um, in their possession, and yeah. um, um, the bail for that is almost nothing. Funny. So whether right. you're stealing a car, committing an auto burglary, doing a shoplifting, um, uh, those cases, if they don't, um, uh, if they don't uh, uh, go down into a, you know, become or transform into a violent, a violent crime are, mm -hmm. um, are not resulting in a person uh, staying in custody for hardly any time at all. Literally, they can be cited out. So, um, you know, choosing to, to make your money that way or choosing to commit those crimes, um, the consequence is very low right now as well, and that's a, right. that's a, another problem. Yeah, yeah, that's that's tricky. I know it, the uh, you know, the decisions the uh, the courts are making. So much of that is is out of our hands. I'm sure you know we all are, are looking at these numbers and, and asking ourselves what we can do to to make sure that the uh, you know, the the frequency and intensity of so many of these these violent acts is uh, is addressed. Uh, but I realize we said two minutes, and I'm way over. Thanks, Chief. Thank you. And um, Chief, um, really appreciate the information. Um, if, if you could be um, a bit succinct in your responses, we greatly appreciate it, as I know we have some other information to present as part of this item. Um, Councilmember Dobble. Thank you. And thank you, Chief. Um, I have a couple of questions. One, I would like to make a request. When you do your charts, if you could just code do the coding, color coding the same in the, each chart, it would be easier to follow because larceny was orange one time, it was blue, and I don't know. 
I'm just saying it would be easier to follow if it, they were all the same color each scenario. Um, and then also, I had a couple of questions. Um, I, I couldn't understand what you said when you said the rapes. Most of them were they, did you say they were stranger attacks? No. Or not? They're no. not stranger attacks. Right. Okay, that's what I didn't understand. And then also, and you're saying that these um, citations for auto theft, they're for auto theft, they're citations and not, is that what you said? Yeah, if you're if a person's arrested on a straight stolen auto, uh, and there's nothing else, they're going to get a ticket and be released. Wow, interesting. And then, um, and that's true for serial offenders too. You said. Um, yes, it sort of it can depend if there's a, I don't know, an existing uh, felony warrant, um, but generally speaking for uh, property crimes, uh, even multiple offenses, people are um, getting released on citation of here. And, that, and that's just because of COVID? Uh, it... Yeah, I think it's because the, the uh, bail schedule was, was reduced in an effort to- um, Keep people uh, out of prison. Keep people out of jail and out of uh, the congregant setting. Mm -hmm. And then also with these catalytic converters, um, are there specific cars that they're going after? Uh, Toyota Priuses, I think, are the number one victim of that. Toyota trucks, I believe, get it as well. And then also, um, did you say, I, I heard you said identity theft is up, but did you also say unemployment? It's uh, fraudulent claims for unemployment is, is the new, newly emerging crime of choice, from what I understand from our property crimes investigators. Because apparently you can, you can, um, uh, submit a fraudulent claim for employment uh, and um, uh, and obtain um, uh, you know some amount of money for doing that. So it's very low risk, very low risk of being apprehended. And, and I that's would, it. Okay, I'm sorry. That's similar to identity theft. That's a crime that occurs out of sight. It's very difficult to apprehend people. So we over time have seen people lean into identity theft as a criminal enterprise. Is the identity theft part of the EDD? Um, theft as well? It can be involved uh, because you would um, use somebody's personal identifying information uh, and maybe change the address and then uh, submit the fraudulent claim. Hmm. Okay, and then, you know, um, the bike patrols, can we make that equitable so that they can be in all the districts or how does that work? Well, the, the, uh, right now they are uh, in the place that's having the most activity and the most kind of call for service activity which is the downtown and telegraph. Um, <clears throat> I think staffing, our staffing levels are, uh, say, um, fragile. Uh, so we don't have the resources to, um, uh, to add uh, more to them at this point. Um, so it's not possible to like uh, have them go in one place for a certain amount of time and then to another location so that it's more equitable? Well, yeah, I think the, the challenge is that there's um, uh, so much activity in the places that are at uh, where um, that's, that generates the calls for service. It's not to say they can't potentially go down. The other thing is that we're in, I guess, week, uh, you know, week three of bikes. And uh, so I want to keep an open mind about that as well. And then can you also um, speak to the um, shootings in District 2? Sure. Um, so uh, our investigators are um, uh, looking at all of the all of the shootings there. <clears throat> In each case, they generally collect some evidence, uh, forensic evidence, uh, which they uh, analyze. Uh, they're um, uh, currently, I think, the thought is that there are some uh, interpersonal conflicts that are going on that are uh, resulting in a small number of people being violent against each other. Um, and uh, although there is some connection between some of the incidents, they're not sort of all connected, so you can't really paint them with a general swath like that. Um, our, our goal is to uh, investigate, uh, even when we uh, don't have cooperative victims, uh, so that we can hopefully get a hold of, minimally get a hold of the firearm. Uh, and what we found is that um, um, when you get the firearm, um, sometimes a single firearm can be connected to multiple acts of gun violence not only in Berkeley, but across the region. 
And so we feel like getting that gun in our hands uh, is helpful for um, hopefully uh, cutting down on some of the violence. Then, um, I think, uh, what about like ceasefire or live free type of program? Um, would you be interested in pursuing something like that to deal with the shootings in District 2? Yeah, I think the custom notification side of a ceasefire program are intriguing. Um, it's a, a resource issue also for us, but I have an open mind on it. And then can you also, um, can you talk about what's happening with the um, gun buyback program? Uh, we have, I believe, uh, had to suspend that because of the various uh, budget deferrals we're making this fiscal year. Mm. Okay, and then also lastly, um, so the other day you, um, with the shootings, you were able to make an arrest and there was a car that was abandoned. Um, and I was curious if you knew the color of that car and can you speak about the arrest? Yeah, I think there are two separate cases. There was a shooting in which a car was abandoned but no one was taken into custody. I don't know the color of that car, I'm sorry. The other case <clears throat> was uh, where uh, officers actually saw uh, people shooting from a vehicle uh, and uh, pursued it. They got the vehicle stopped, I believe on the freeway, ultimately took two people into custody and wrote a search warrant for the car and recovered a stolen handgun in that case. It was the car stolen as well? No, I don't believe so. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. That was it. Thank you. Councilmember Harrison. Uh, yeah, Chief, thank you very much for this report. I found it much more thorough and, and helpful and um, than in past years, and I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the work you're doing on RIPA, because I think RIPA, not sure how it's pronounced, because I think that will make an enormous difference to our ability to analyze um, policy questions. Um, I do want to say something about the no bail situation. It's not simply the courts, it's also the um, sheriff's office has requested this because they are concerned about jail populations and they are under orders to reduce the jail populations because of COVID. So there's a, a mix of things happening here. And if our one of our ballot measures passes in November, we're gonna see a lot fewer people on bail. Potentially, we're gonna have pe more people on own recognizance. And I think we're all gonna have to figure out how to interview people and get the information we need, even given that situation. So this bail situation is really fluid at the moment and there are gonna be changes anyway. So it's something we're just gonna have to work through. And I know it's, it must be incredibly frustrating for you. Um, it is very frustrating for our people. And I, I hope that regardless, of the, not regardless, but with the development of um, kind of bail reform, that there's a tension on the serial repeat offender side of it. If that makes sense, it's yes. you know we've got to we've got to come up with something that interdicts on the people who are repeating who are um, uh, doing the crime over and over and over again and having impact on our community. Um, so yeah, you're, it is very and it is very frustrating for our investigators uh, because um, you know they're they're doing their best to make a difference and um, uh, the structure is uh, the lack of structure with that can undermine their efforts. Well, part of the assessment tools will be, if this passes, will be about um, likelihood of reoffending. So, and rather than based on people's ability to pay. So I'm, I'm you know, I think it'll be, it's gonna be good to see how that plays out. Um, the other thing I wanted to um, mention is on the bike patrols. I really appreciate that everyone would like to have the bike patrols, but I know that the um, Homeless Action Center did a study of most interactions with pedestrians and bicyclists in Berkeley between the police and pedestrians and bicyclists. And there were eight corners that had most of those interactions, which is where the bike patrols are really helpful. These weren't just all homeless individuals. It was that the Homeless Action Center just took it on themselves to do this analysis. And those eight are focused in downtown and on Telegraph. So I sort of second your thinking that there's a lot more of those offenses that can be approached easily on bikes in those those particular areas. And um, thank you for making that happen and standing up those patrols. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Bartlett. Thank you, Anna, and thank you, Chief, for your presentation. Um, it's um, <clears throat> wonderful to see your, your RIPA presentation. Uh, and you may recall, I think uh, more than a year ago, a couple years ago, we discussed 
uh, the possible technologies you have at your disposal uh, to make so the arduous data collection uh, more easy. And it looks like you've taken that. That's wonderful. Uh, so quickly, just to address the, the, uh, the good news, right? Robbery is down. Uh, larceny is down. Rape is down. Uh, however, murder is up. And um, interestingly, uh, arson is up. And so uh, can you very, very quickly, because I remember the question, uh, what, is, what arson are we talking about? Is this involving encampments or apartments or cars? What's happening? Uh, there's, I think, not a particular uh, pattern. Um, I do not have a breakdown of, of particulars of which arsons, you know, what's striking, uh, what's striking what. I think we have, um, um, uh, it's not infrequent that we have folks setting things on fire. Um, and, uh, but I don't have a particular uh, particular um, a trend, I guess. Okay, very, very curious about that. Uh, and then also I'm wondering, uh, and this is, uh, you know, we, we all know there was a noose uh, recently uh, found tied in Berkeley uh, by an individual and that was charged with a hate crime. Uh, and I'm wondering, um, it, do you have a designation for hate crimes in this breakout um, or will you going forward? Curious to your thoughts. Um, so we, we certainly, um, we certainly can, uh, uh, can share information on hate crimes. I don't have it in this report. I haven't historically, <clears throat> excuse me, but, um, uh, that is something we can incorporate, I think for sure, um, to, uh, to report on that. Uh, okay. This incident was pretty remarkable. Um, you know, we got called by a, by a Marina staffer about this person who had hung a noose. I believe the photograph of that has been carried by uh, Berkeley side and the officer um, went down and, and immediately had contact with the suspect and was able to make an arrest in that. Okay, great. That's, thank you. Yeah, it, so it, it would be, I guess, helpful to, to, to chart um, if there's any hate incidents. I know uh, the mayor discussed this with his, um, uh, refresh my, my memory, the um, standing against hate um, policies um, so it'd be helpful to at least note uh, instances of sort of biased, in, you know, incident, physical incidents of violence that are motivated by uh, racial animus or, or any kind of animus. Um, it'd be useful, I guess, uh, even though I don't suspect it's that many, but we do want to check this trend uh, right. in our city. And we do have that data for hate crimes. Um, that's, we report it on a monthly basis. To, uh, to the state. And so that's data that we can, <clears throat> excuse me, that we can share and anticipate we will share in terms of uh, working on the, uh, the mayor's item, which uh, also envisions, I think, a, um, a hate crime hotline. And uh, I think there's going to be more discussion of that in the Public Safety Policy Committee in the not too distant future. Wonderful. Thanks very much. Thank you. Council Member Wangrap. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chief, for the report. Um, uh, my question is, do you ever have a use a mapping program so that we can see um, where where the crimes are taking place? And, um, you, you know, I know that there's this app online that you can get um, that shows you little icons of what the crime is uh -huh. and where they take place. <clears throat> so um, there is a site called Crime Mapping. Yeah. Uh, and you can go on and customize your time frame uh, and the kinds of crimes you're interested in, uh, and it can provide that. Uh, we could, um, I think we'd end up getting into providing lots of different maps. Um, I don't know if that's what we want for this report or not, but it's certainly something we look at. But I, I really encourage people who are interested to look at crimemapping.com because we provide them with our information and it's very user friendly and you can really zoom in or zoom out and um, uh, gather the data you want. Okay, um, and then I'm, I'm particularly curious about the shootings um, and um, the increase in, in shootings. And I know uh, we even had a murder in, in my district, which is quite unusual. Um, we had a shooting in District 5, I believe. Um, so um, it's, it seems like uh, more people are carrying guns. Is that uh, uh, my my perception, or is it real? No, I think it's real. Uh, I think um, um, 
another crime that does not get you necessarily um, uh, in jail for more than a ticket is carrying a gun, uh, for shooting somebody, obviously, but uh, possessing a gun is um, uh, does not bring a big level of accountability with it right now. Uh, I, I know that in, um, in agencies uh, in the region, people are seeing an uh, increase in shootings and gun violence. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm not sure exactly what that's, uh, what that's related to. Uh, it, I have a sense that, um, uh, well, I have a sense that uh, there are a lot of stressors in play and that where there's um, uh, a lack of accountability, where you feel like you could potentially carry a gun, drive a school in auto, and that the consequence will be um, a, a citation, that there's less of a deterrent effect in that. Um, so the shootings we've had in Berkeley, like I uh, believe I said earlier, um, they're not all connected. There have been uh, some that may be connected, but, um, and our homicides are, are all individual uh, unconnected events as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Kesterwani. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Chief Greenwood, for your presentation. I know this was scheduled previously, so I'm glad that we could uh, receive your presentation. I wanted to ask you a couple questions about the marina because um, we, we've seen an uptick um, with reported crimes um, there. Do you have a date or a sense of the timeline for when the police substation will relocate to the marina? I believe uh, we're looking at, we're hoping for a March. Okay. Uh, for the work to be done, um, the improvement to be done, and then the, the move to be made. Okay, thank you. And I know, uh, I, I believe it was Council Member Harrison who had mentioned bike patrols. And we learned, we had a public safety meeting with folks at the marina with our area coordinator, and we understood that bike patrols would come to the marina as well. Do you have a timeline for that? No, I don't have a, um, I don't have a sense that we're going to have a um, bike patrol, a group of bike patrol assigned to the marina. Uh, we are, the, the air coordinator might have been talking about, um, so something I didn't mention is that we're uh, training more people so they can ride bikes, so that we okay. may be uh, putting people out on bikes, depending, especially you know, sort of post-COVID, but um, where they can ride the bikes doing special details. So it's not just the sergeant and six, but that we have others who can ride bikes. That might have been what the air coordinator was talking about. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And then finally, you know, on the subject of the uptick in property crimes, um, do you have just general advice that you can share with the public of, of you know, things to, to remember to um, protect themselves and specifically on the catalytic converters? Um, is there anything anyone, uh, people can do? You know, I, I imagine the best thing is to park your car in a garage, but if you don't have a garage, I just wonder if you have any advice on the property crimes. I think um, on the catalytic converters, I believe that uh, there are um, uh, mechanics who will essentially fortify the converter so it's not so easy to take. Mm -hmm. um, and um, actually our community services bureau is working on a little, uh, we're gonna try I think a sort of public service announcement about catalytic converter thefts that I expect in the next few weeks. Um, with regards to auto burglary, my advice would be to not leave anything in your car when you park in the passenger compartment or the trunk. Um, the, uh, just that uh, people can uh, walk by, look in. Uh, folks sometimes know there's going to be a remote trunk release in the car. It's easy to smash a window, reach in, pop the trunk, you know, and clean out the trunk. And so the, the best prevention there is to um, leave nothing visible in the car and to not leave anything valuable in the trunk as well. Thank you very much. Sure. Councilor Drosty. Hi, Chief. Thank you so much for the report. Um, you know, I think I have uh, similar questions in, in that I don't think they have easy answers. You know, I, I also am concerned about the, um, the increase in larcenies and, of course, the homicides we've seen. And, you know, I'm just wondering what you think would be helpful just in terms of resources or what the city council can do to, to help address sort of these serious crimes that are occurring in our city. 
not to put you on the spot, <laughs> with like yeah. a very challenging. No, I mean, uh, to an extent, it comes down to um, there are several things in play, um, and the the current sort of COVID and bail system, for example, is one of them. Uh, but the other is, um, you know, is the the resources within the department. Uh, a chunk of that delivers baseline kind of patrol response, uh, and another chunk is our investigators um, who handle follow-on investigations and can make an impact through doing that. Uh, with, um, you know, we, with our uh, structure, um, and at the moment we're able to staff uh, bikes, uh, but um, um, I think just attending to uh, keeping those resources as strong as we can, even as we do work to uh, try to meet the goals of uh, the budget deferrals. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, those are, those I think are, are what we need. Um, uh, people would certainly, um, for example, people would certainly like to have a lot more bike patrol. A long time ago, there were, there were um, probably a dozen people on the bike patrol. Uh, and they were in um, West Berkeley, South Berkeley, downtown, Telegraph, even North Berkeley. Um, so, um, you know, we'll keep, we'll keep doing everything we can with the resources we have uh, to have an impact. Uh, and I think, um, uh, I think I would just ask careful's, uh, council's careful listening and consideration of the information that, uh, you know, that we bring to you. Uh, we'll try and be transparent about what our struggles are and what our concerns are. Um, and, uh, keep, uh, you know, keep working on that. No, I, I appreciate that. I, I know I too am interested in, in bike patrols and I'm very excited that, um, <clears throat> that we're seeing more cops on bikes because of course we like, we like officers to be out of their cars. And um, I, I, you know, I know I hear a lot of constituents asking for that. I also wanna speak out in favor of um, coffee with a cop. That it, I, I've heard a lot of great feedback around that. And I know it, it's, we're in a different uh, time now with this virtual world that we're living in, but um, you know, I know that's a very popular, uh, popular program. And you know, lastly, I'll just end with, um, you know, I've, I've heard and I, I personally know people who've, who have had uh, interactions with your investigative unit and have had really positive things to say, you know, one, uh, I, I'm thinking of one specific instance of, uh, you know, a young child who had to interact with the, um, with the police and had to go through the investigations procedure, and you know the parents were were very pleased with um, with how BPD was very gentle with their child, and I just really wanted to state that because it was very meaningful to this family. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any raised hands, so Chief, if we can proceed to the next part of the presentation, that'd be great. All right. All right, so <clears throat> uh, this, uh, with this report, we're presenting for the first time on uh, use of force, and we're going to look at uh, the last five years worth of force data. Um, a little bit of background, force is used uh, typically to affect arrest, uh, overcome resistance, affect arrest. Force is generally reactive, that is to say it's based on the suspect's actions and uh, geared up and down based on levels of resistance that's being provided by the suspect. Uh, force is uh, uh, preceded by uh, efforts to de-escalate, uh, to use time to not be rushed, to use distance to not get too close, and to give people an opportunity to um, comply with the officer's requests. Uh, also, uh, most of our reported use of force uh, incidents <clears throat> are um, arising out of officers responding to calls for service rather than officer-initiated activity. Uh, so um, I believe in 2019, I think we had three of the use of forces um, came from officer-initiated activity Everything else was where we were called uh, because of a crime or an incident and ended up uh, needing to use force to uh, overcome resistance or effect arrest. Uh, the types of force we report under our uh, almost, I would say under our existing policy, but right now we're actually transitioning to the new use of force policy 300. Uh, training is happening on that this week in uh, blocks, uh, four hour blocks uh, across the department. 
And so, um, how, however, the force I'm reporting here is based on our general order U2, uh, and it uh, mandates that we report force when there's complaint of pain by a suspect, when there's visible injury to a suspect, or when there's use of any, any weapon by an officer. And so uh, that's what um, results in a uh, reported use of force, <clears throat> excuse me, under, under our general order U2. Uh, to give a little bit of context, uh, we've got a five-year average here of incidents that BPD has handled. That comes out to 76,896 incidents per year that BPD is called upon to handle. Um, this gives a five-year look at our arrests. The average is 3,017 arrests per year. And then this shows by average uh, force. So our average for five years is 31.8 incidents where force is used um, as compared to 3,017 arrests and 76,896 incidents. Uh, by uh, the way I interpret this, it shows how successful officers are at managing incidents with a minimal amount of reliance on force to get the, uh, the incident resolved. Uh, and that means there's gonna be a minimal amount of harms. Uh, so, um, excuse me. So uh, that, is, uh, that is sort of my takeaway for this. We have force used once every 2,418 incidents, used once every 95 arrests. This graph shows the types of force that we're tracking and how they're used each year. Um, the 2018, uh, what's going on with that is that was our, where our staffing plunged to kind of historic lows. Uh, so there were just far fewer, um, uh, you know, we were working just to keep beats filled. Um, there were, uh, I think, fewer, fewer special assignments filled and so forth. So I believe that's a 2018 result there. Um, so this break. Um, right, you're not sharing your screen, so we don't see these graphs. Is that I'm, your I'm not, intent? I'm no, it's my intent to show the screens. Uh, I'm not sure how I fell out of doing that. I'm going to back out for a second. I have to thank Councilmember Davila because I was wondering on, if guys. it was just me. Um, Chief, do you still have the green share screen button on your toolbar? Um, no, I'm looking for the um, I'm looking for the Zoom meeting. Let me let me go back to full screen with the Zoom meeting. There's that. There's share screen. Thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate it, Councilmember Davila. Let's try that again. I think when I came back for questions, I stepped out of it. How there are we doing go. now? Uh, Perfect. Yeah, we can see your screen now. Okay. All right, so I talked about types of force reported, and you have these slides in the, in the handout. Um, incidents per year over five years, arrests per year over five years, showing the averages considering five years, and then types of force used <clears throat> uh, broken down uh, by the kinds of uh, force that was used. And then uh, I want to give a sense of some of the suspect actions that uh, you know, led to uses of force in 2019. Uh, this is not all of them, but this is some of them. Um, for example, a suicidal suspect chased a person with a knife, refused to drop the knife upon command by the officers. A suspect barricaded himself and tried to set himself on fire. Another knife brandishing suspect refused to comply with the officer's orders. A suspect in an assault via machete refused to comply. Uh, a suspect broke into a house, uh, ended up holding knife to throat, throat of the victim. Um, a robbery suspect uh, armed with a sword refused to drop the weapon and then advanced on officers. Uh, that occurred up on the pedestrian overpass bridge um, and uh, a case where a suspect tried to take an officer's holstered gun. So um, these are uh, just some of the uh, kinds of actions that lead to uh, the use of force in 2019. Um, and um, uh, others just include a variety of uh, suspects resisting arrest, attempting to flee, 
attempting to flee after being handcuffed, refusing to drop weapons, um, and so forth. So I just wanted to give you a little sense of that. Um, I received a little feedback that people would be interested in hearing more about the kinds of actions that result in officer using force. Uh, and so these are, um, these are examples from 2019. And then this is race and gender uh, data on force for the five-year total. Um, and uh, I don't have particular conclusions because uh, force often, uh, because force, uh, not often, force is used um, in arrest scenarios uh, for whatever the uh, offense is. Um, so I sort of look to, well, is that, does that correlate a bit? And um, um, if you look at five-year arrest data demographics, uh, there are some similarities. Um, uh, white males is 23% on the arrest side, 30% on use of force. Um, Hispanic males uh, are 8% uh, on the use of force, 10% on the arrest side. Uh, black males, 40% in the arrests, uh, and also 40% of the use of force, and so forth. Um, I, I think I'm open to your suggestions about how this information would be helpful to you. Uh, and just sharing with you the place that I go to is, okay, is force disproportionately used on, uh, on people, on different demographics um, as associated with arrests? And they seem to line up um, fairly uh, in a similar way. Um, but uh, this is definitely an area that I'm open to your input about what's helpful for you. And I know this is the first time we're presenting on force. I am looking for your, uh, your feedback um, and I welcome that so that we can uh, be providing you with uh, the information we want to. I, I would want to add a sort of editorial note, which is that <clears throat> as we transition to policy 300, the new use of force policy, there will be more reported uses of force because we're going to report on um, force that heretofore hasn't risen to the level of reporting. So that's force generally used to overcome resistance. Uh, and of course, if uh, officers point a gun at somebody, that sort of thing. So um, what we'll see next year will be an increase, um, but it'll be because we're reporting, well, I think we'll, we'll compare and see if the same kinds of force we report on over the years if that continues to be about the same. Um, and then we'll have other uh, types of force added onto that. So we'll incorporate that in years to come. This is sort of similar to what happened with uh, sex crimes. Uh, certain kinds of sexual assaults were not reportable under UCR. And then I wanna say in 2015 or 16, the, the uniform crime reporting definition changed. So we, if you didn't know better, you would see a big spike in the number of sexual assaults. What was really happening was, um, assaults that had not previously been reported were now classified as reportable sexual assault, so it went up. So I anticipate that same sort of effect with our use of force reporting next year. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Once again, two minutes per council member. Um, before I call on members of the council who've sought recognition, open government ordinance requires that we open public hearings before 10 o'clock. So for procedural purposes, I'd like to open the public hearing on item 20. The California Municipal Financing Authority bond financing for 1717 University Avenue and open the public hearing on the ZAP appeal for 1346 Ordway. And we will come back to those items at the conclusion of this discussion. So that satisfies the um, requirement of the open up government ordinance to have the hearings open by 10 o'clock. Okay, first council member is Councilor Dowell. I'm muted, sorry. Um, thank you for the report. I was curious, um, use of force, does that include when weapons are drawn? No, not under, not under our previous general order. It will in the future under policy 300. And what is that um, effective as? We're implementing it now, so I think it'll probably be um, uh, later this month. We're doing the training now and that's a time where we can uh, see if there are issues that we need to address, make sure we have understandings clear from our officers um, so that they've absorbed the new policy uh, and that they're confident in operating under it. So a little later in October is what I expect. And excuse me. Um, so you said like with the um, 
40% for black is also 40% arrest. Uh, and then as well as the whites, the same percentage of whatever, I forget what it was because I don't have it in front of me, but um, I was just curious as, which I don't know if this was the time or not, or if I should have said it last time, but you didn't speak to the um, um, CPE report at all. And I was curious about that. Uh, the CPE report has not been dealing, I mean, it, um, well, well, there was an a report on four, so it's not part of this report. Okay. Never mind them. I was talking about during COVID because there was an analysis done and uh, there was an increase. Actually, the disparity got increased during COVID, um, but. Yeah, that was not a CPE analysis. No, um, I know it was an off. It wasn't them, but it was still an analysis based on the data that you provided. Anyway, thank you. Thank you very much, Council Member Harrison. Yes, uh, Chief, thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the new reports. They're going to be all use of reports. I had some specific questions about your report. One is on the, um, when you talk about uh, de-escalation techniques, does that include restraint and use of spit hoods? Please stop my time. Thank you. You saw my time while the chief is answering. Thank you. Excuse me, Mark. Yeah, so when Mark, Mark we've got to pause it. I would like my minding the clock. Yeah, thank you, Chief. So where does um, use of restraints and uh, et cetera fit in? Is that considered a de-escalation technique or is it recorded here? And it will it be recorded in the new use of force report? Those will be reported under the new use of force policy. Okay. Um, all right, great. And You're muted, Council Member. Councilor Harrison, we can't hear you. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, you said there might be more than one use technique and more than one officer may be involved. When that occurs, is that reported once or multiple times, depending on the number of officers and types of use of force? Right, it's, it would be multiple times. So you might have 31 incidents, but that's why you have 69 um, uh, 69. Um, pieces of data. Okay. Um, you also mentioned that use of less lethal systems is limited to specially trained officers. Could you talk about that a little more? Who those officers are? Sure. Well, our officers have um, officers who can use the uh, less lethal systems have special training to, to in order to qualify and use them. Uh, and that is something that we are trying to be broad on to make sure that uh, we have uh, lots of folks who are able to use those tools. Um, they've been very successful in I think in bringing incidents to a close rapidly with a minimum of harms while still preserving a, a setback or distance, uh, which is um, uh, a piece of the escalation is to try to use time and distance. And ultimately, um, uh, our goal is to have as many officers as possible trained to use those tools so they're able to. Um, as, as compared to, for example, some agencies where maybe only the sergeants have them in their trunks, what you want is you want to have your tools available to bring quickly to bear if you need to in order to um, you know safely resolve an incident and so um, that answer your question yeah no that's very helpful and it's not limited to a team like the SWAT team correct whether that officer has the training okay <clears throat> I really appreciated your um, uh, chart the uh, for the demographics. And I think one of the public uh, letters we got said, please do that in future in the written report because everywhere else we have a uh, visual display. Right. And it tracks arrests because it's all part of the same issue. We don't exactly know where this is coming from. We know there are disparate um, uh, interactions. We don't know where it all comes from, but it all tracks together. And the CPE report did address use of force and did talk about the 40, times greater use of force with African Americans. But again, it's in parallel with mm -hmm. more arrests. So I just think it's not that CPE didn't address it. They did address it as part of the bigger picture. In the 2018 report from a couple of years ago. Yeah. And right. I don't recall that exact statistic, but okay. Great, so if we get to see that visually in future reports, that would be great. 
Okay, and then um, I had one more question. I'm really sorry. Um, I guess basically I would really like to, just as we do this use of force report, have an acknowledgement of these disparities. We don't know where they're coming from, but I think talking about them more in text as well as displaying them visually would be very helpful so we can see if there's any change over time. I just think it's a point that needs to be talked about more thoroughly. Which disparities do you mean? Oh, between the, in the um, use of force by race and gender. Um, and again, we don't know all the causes of that, but it would be good to have more discussion of that. Like next year when we do the report, do we see less of a disparity, more of a disparity? How does that look compared to the population in the city? Okay, I'm, I really want to respect council's time. I'm not track, I, I want to track with what you're saying and maybe that's a conversation we could have okay. um, yeah. in, in the future because my point is that I would expect, I would, I would expect that since force happens during arrest encounters, one thing you look at is the demographics of arrest encounters, and you would expect to see similar uh, amounts of force. For example, if um, uh, if uh, white males were arrested, uh, you know, 10% um, uh, of the time, but force is used on white males 40% uh, or 50% of the time, that's a disparity that that to me doesn't make sense, or you know, I would I'd be concerned yeah. about that. When it aligns with the arrest rates by demographics, um, that um, seems to make sense to me. So I'm not discounting that there are disparities in a whole bunch of uh, society and police and law enforcement encounters mm -hmm. and interactions, um, but um, uh, yeah, I think we could have a discussion about what what the dispa what disparities is and how to determine that. Right, and that's the focus of the mayor's task force. So if perhaps in the next report, year's report, you could just show how it compares to arrest rates by group. That right. would be really helpful. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Vice Mayor Hahn. Thank you. I just wanted to draw my colleagues' attention to the supplemental that I put in, um, asking for a couple of additional things to be included in the reports. Um, one is um, peak and other historical crime data, so that the most recent data is contextualized more broadly. I um, appreciate seeing five-year trends. I personally think year-over-year -year trends are very little um, sort of uh, probative value in that, uh, you know, everything goes up a little bit and down a little bit every year, but I'm really interested in what are the, the big trends. Um, and I think even five years doesn't really show that. Um, also, um, I've asked if we could do reference point of other jurisdictions. How do we compare on some of the big numbers or big, you know, this going up, that going down? Um, you know, what does it look like in other uh, urban, um, you know, locations? I don't think we need to compare to Lafayette or something like that, but, you know, um, you know, comparable um, jurisdictions. I would like to add to that, that I'm interested in seeing the data by neighborhood. Um, it's, uh, that is a piece of information that I think would be very interesting and useful. If it can't be broken down by district, then maybe by zip code um, would give us some, an interesting picture within the city, um, et cetera. But I also just wanted to point out a couple of things one is that um, <laughs> this is 85% of, of crime seems to be uh, perpetrated by men. And why do we talk about this as just crime? Uh, we need to think about um, what's going on with men in our society and in our community and why they feel so unsupported. Um, and then, you know, I, I second Councilmember Harrison's comments uh, asking for. Um, just some more detail on things. But um, yeah, those are my main comments. I really, I think in, in the areas where there's big disparities, the biggest disparity is women to men. Um, and no one ever wants to talk about that. And the second biggest, obviously, is, is racial. Um, but I think if we don't talk about things the way they are, then we miss important information. So I appreciate all these reports and um, Look forward to hearing public comment. Thank you, Councilmember Bartlett. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for this um, excellent presentation. So, uh, so to understand, uh, 
the the reason there's no historical comparison is that the metrics we're using are are new. Is that right? Are you referring to Councilmember Hans, the longer term that she was talking about? Or? Well, I'm just saying I'm, I'm I can't see your slide in, on my screen, but um, I do. I don't. I don't recall it being compared to last year, but the year before. Is that? Uh, Am I misremembering? Yeah, for the slide is in the pack. Uh, yeah, the slide is in the packet. So, in terms of force, I believe the the. Uh, I'm sorry, are you referring to force, Councilman Bartlett? Yeah, yeah, use of force. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is page 13 of the report of the item. Uh, it shows the same slide that I show on the um, on the presentation here. And and I'm sorry, but is there an historical um, analysis there? Historical and not um, like this is 2019, then 2018, you know, like that. No, there's not a there's not a breakdown by year with particular comment. This is 2018 is when we we really um, our staffing the bottom dropped out, and we were just keeping together the officers with young beats. Okay, so 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 it's kind of a novel, um, first of its kind sort of snapshot. Okay. Yes. In we a, so and, and we don't, I don't believe we have data. I don't know that we have data before that because we, we started using the software to track the data in 2015. Okay. And, and I do want to, I do want to uh, also um, second my colleagues um, uh, desire to see this compared to other jurisdictions, although I suspect it will be better than most jurisdictions. Uh, based on my encounters with you all. Um, I'm also curious about, you know, I also want to just uh, want to just hone in for a second on the the ratio of those arrested versus those who receive force because, uh, you know, I would put forward that the arrest records are skewed due to racial profiling. Uh, and so I don't necessarily want to equate those two numbers because we know that from uh, from arrest to sentencing to probation, um, it, it's skewed due to the very first onus uh, profiling. Um, and then, and I'm also curious too, if we could include um, in the next report or come back to us, what have you, I'm curious to see the, 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 the race of the officer uh, who is engaging in the use of force against the, the person, uh, the perpetrator, if you will. So we can see both races side by side and see if we can maybe get to the, get a clear snapshot of what's happening. Is that, is that doable? I believe so. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Kessawani. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Chief Greenwood, for this uh, report about use of force. Um, I wanted to ask you with the racial identification I think you may have answered this before. So I just wanted to clarify. My understanding is that that is the officer's perception of the person's race. Is that accurate? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, and then I, um, maybe I'm gonna differ from Council Member Bartlett because I, I think I would agree with Council Member Harrison that I think that it, it would be, I would be interested to see the arrest rate by race alongside the use of force rates that you showed. And, but I do wanna acknowledge what Council Member Bartlett said, which is that um, there is a, a huge disproportionality between the percentage of African-Americans in our community and the percentage that are arrested. So I'm not saying that that's okay, that, that we're arresting, um, 40% 40 40 of our arrests are black males. I, I, I don't want to suggest that that's okay, but in sort of understanding that use of force 40%, I do think it is it is valuable to have the context of, of the racial breakdown of the arrests. I, I think part of what we need to interrogate further with our reimagining are those, those disparities in arrests. So I wanted to say that. And then on my final question is, on the, is there any way to get at the type of calls that led to use of force? Is that something we could discern from our data? Could you talk about how that 
that could be done? I think that's something we could work out how to provide. <clears throat> Along with, and this, this directly, um, uh, in direct response to Councilmember Bartlett's uh, concerns about profiling, I think an important piece of information is, um, did the officer, um, is this a self-initiated event where the officer stopped somebody or is this the officer responding to information the officer is being given by somebody who's calling to report a, a crime or an issue or an incident? Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, that, that's information I think we should uh, be including as well. I, I just, I uh, don't have it in the report, but I recall that three of the incidents in 2019, uh, three of the force incidents uh, were um, officer initiated and the remainder were officers responding to a call. So they're responding to um, what someone's calling in about. Uh-huh, okay, because then, then sort of a secondary question from that is trying to understand in some of those instances, are we dealing with actually uh, a mental health issue or, or something like that? Um, that? That might help us better understand the nature of these situations. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Councilmember Drosty. Um, thank you for the report. Um, it's very enlightening and I know that uh, we have a lot of work to do. Um, <clears throat> just one thing with regard to some of the additional data that was, was requested. I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not necessarily, uh, I'm a little bit concerned that we're gonna, we're gonna ask you to do so much work that, that you get bogged down with providing reference points to other jurisdiction. I mean, I'm less interested in hearing, a, you know, a crime report about San Francisco and San Leandro and more interested in hearing about Berkeley trends. I mean, I feel like we can get that, that data and also with the mapping. I do think, you know, the, the information around um, the force that is used around the type of incident, the level of force, the race and gender. I think that's important information to have. Um, but I, you know, I just worry that, um, you know, I want to make sure that we're using our staff resources wisely and, and not creating, um, you know, busy work and asking about best practices in other jurisdictions. When I imagine there would be a lot of, um, Variables, a lot of variables involved. So for instance, um, we're a university town and ultimately I'm, I'm not sure how much um, having that sort of best practices information presented in our crime report would lead to a different policy outcome. I mean, I think we all would agree we just wanna see, um, we, we wanna see our levels of crime and we wanna figure out ways to reduce them. So I'm just wondering how you might go about sort of the, that best practices and pulling from other jurisdictions and what would be comparable cities and if you feel like that would be a good uh, good avenue to pursue um, just in terms of, of us providing you guidance and public policy decisions. Yeah, I've, I haven't really wrapped my, wrapped my head around it. Um, uh, I can see the pluses and the minuses, um, you know, um, uh, comparing our crime to other communities. We're such a unique community because of the University of California uh, and just um, of our placement in the region. Um, and so that makes it hard to be, to me, that presents challenges in terms of comparing to other agencies. That said, I think that, um, I, you, I think you've often heard me say, regionally, this is happening or that is happening. For example, uh, shootings uh, are going up, I know, uh, in Oakland. Um, and um, so there are times when, um, when we see regional increases like auto thefts or auto burglaries or certain kinds of crime series, I think it's valuable to have context for that. Um, an, overall, um, uh, an overall comparison, it sort of depends what, we're what question we're trying to answer. So, um, you know, you give me some, some stuff to think about and We'll do our we'll do our best to uh, come up with something. Okay, thanks. That's all my time. Thanks. Okay, Chief. Is there an, any other information the department would like to present on this item? No. That's it. Okay. I'm. I'm. Uh, okay. Now I'm going to share screen back.
All right, and for uh, for this part of the presentation, is this the last part of the item? Yes, the last. This is the. You know, it's ten o'clock. I just want to be mindful of time, um, and so I know that there are council members have questions. Um, if we can just keep our questions and answers succinct. Next time, I'd like to respectfully request that if we're going to have a you know hour and a half presentation that we, we could schedule this during a work session because we have several other action items we have to get to. So um, I just wanted to make that request and um, Chief, the floor is yours. All right, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Chuck Gunter who are, who's our fiscal administrative services man uh, manager. Uh, can I Chuck you on the call here? Yeah, thank you, Chief. Um, thank you, Council, Mayor. I'm just gonna go over briefly, I'll try to be as brief as possible, um, go over the 2020 actuals versus the budget and uh, where we landed and what brought us to where we are. So, um, basically, uh, the, the BPD overtime budget has been fixed at under $2.5 million for over a decade and hasn't been sufficient to cover overtime expenses. <clears throat> in uh, 2019 uh, budget subcommittee presentation, we have posted this slide where we showed the trend uh, being 247% up to 285% of budget over the fiscal year 16, 17, and 18. So we wanted to uh, at that point, tried to make the council aware that uh, over time was trending above the allocation early on. So let's switch slides. So there are various factors that impact overtime. Um, various situations mandate or require overtime be utilized to stabilize a situation, complete an investigation, maintain minimum staffing levels, and for officers and staff to attend court. Uh, Pre-scheduled events, unscheduled events, emergency incidents, public safety power shutoffs, and other activities which uh, merit BPD local involvement, along with mutual aid for other community safety, uh, directly impact overtime usage, and vary significantly each year. So large scale events involve the entire department, both sworn and professional staff. So many times it's everybody in the department that has to work when there's an event. Um, there have been increased requests for reimbursable overtime and that does increase our overtime expenditures, but the costs are recovered. And so the result is a net zero impact to the costs, but it does increase our overtime expenditures. Um, all overtime work is required to be approved by a supervisor and lieutenants uh, are paid overtime due to a settlement resulting from a Fair Labor Standards Act litigation that happened in the early 2000s. So this is a, an actual overtime slip and uh, the, the top part is identifies the person working and their normal shift and their days off and then the middle, um, what detail they're on. And then all those small uh, letters and numbers on the bottom portion are each activity codes for uh, whatever detail they're working. And so whether it's a, an event or a grant or any type of work that requires overtime, whether it's filling in for sick, someone out sick, any detail, it's on this sheet. And this has to be signed off by the employee, by the supervisor, and then uh, a manager. So if you could 
go to the next slide. So uh, at the end of the fiscal year, we still had a budget of $2.364 million, but our actual overtime expense was $7.6 million. Let's switch to the next. So this is a, a stacked uh, bar chart showing the amount we were budgeted for each category. And then I can have a brief description on what each category represents and then how much percent over the budget um, we were. So um, the total budget expenditure would be the overage added to the budgeted amount. So those two together would be the actual expenditures. So reimbursable services, these are requested services, which as I stated previously, vary annually, but include services to UC Berkeley for like football games, Berkeley High School, private companies that request enhanced security within the city limits, and the PD gets reimbursed for actual expenditures, which make the costs neutral, but the expenditures do add to the overtime budget. Um, being exceeded. So we were 304% of our budgeted allocation for reimbursable services. So holiday pay um, budgeted 272,000 and our actual was 572,000 which is 210% of our budget. Holiday pay is designed to cover the costs of employees working on city holidays and pay for employees receiving paid holidays off. The budget did not cover the actual expenses and contributed to the overtime budget being overspent. So um, just to go slightly further, we would expect this to be 100% funded, but probably partially related to salary increases. Um, we're not even covered for um, the normal holidays that um, staff have to work. So special events, um, these uh, budget is 100,000 and we spent 724,000, which is 720% of our budget. Special event overtime is designed to cover the costs of employees working many types of events. Events vary annually and many of them are unscheduled and require significant staff resources, which contributed significantly to the overtime budget being overspent. Some pre-scheduled events are reimbursed. Factors um, that also impact the budget are police training. So the budgeted number is supposed to reflect what we would expend and be reimbursed for staff having to attend mandatory trainings or mandatory certifications, and then staff to backfill them in the city while they're training. So the, uh, we were budgeted 250,000, we, we spent 475,000, 190% of budget. Uh, once again, police training is designed to cover the costs of employees while they're in training and for staff to backfill them. Police have significant ongoing training requirements to maintain their peace officer standards and training and other certifications. Um, this also contributes to budget overage. Uh, police vacation relief budgeted for 260,000, actual 584,000, 224% of budget. Police. Uh, vacation relief is designed to cover the cost of employees. While the employee is on vacation, it's to pay for backfill staff while they are off duty. This pertains to both sworn and professional staff in the jail, property room, records, operations, communication center, and the crime scene unit. These are essential operations that require mandatory staffing and contributes a significant portion of our budget coverage. Miscellaneous police business is um, the one area that we're within our budget. 
small dollar amount, 12,000. And um, it's basically a catch-all category if it's not identified in the other categories of overtime. Um, this is where it's uh, categorized. The final one uh, is police regular overtime, which is the majority of our budget expenditure. We're allocated $1 million annually. We spent $4.3 million this fiscal year. That's 431% of budget. Um, this covers a wide range of uh, details, including scheduled and unscheduled events, demonstrations, investigations, operational responses, and this is the most likely category to result in overtime budget overages. Go to the next slide. <clears throat> so additional factors impacting the overtime budget. There were 39 scheduled citywide events and many were canceled this year due to COVID-19. Of the nine city events that we participated in, it resulted in $214,000 of overtime. There were 11 emergency management events. The two public safety power shutoffs um, required $184,000 of overtime. George Floyd demonstrations was $779,000 of overtime. Next slide. Um, police mutual aid events, the Gilroy Garlic Festival. Um, we responded some staff to that to assist them. And that was $14,000 and not reimbursable. The Kincaid fire um, was a law enforcement mutual aid. And because it was um, a FEMA project, we were reimbursed for our expenditures, but it typically doesn't happen the same fiscal year. So, for example, on this one, I just received a check probably a couple of weeks ago, and we performed the, and in last October, we performed the service. Next slide. So, Additionally, uh, restating what I've said before, the overtime budget has not been adjusted above the $2.5 million mark for over 10 years. Bargaining unit agreements contained cost increases, which were not adjusted or reflected in the overtime budget. Lieutenant paid overtime was a result of a Fair Labor Standards Act lawsuit, and unscheduled events have occurred more frequently and have had longer durations. Next slide. Uh, public safety power shutoffs require additional police department resources to ensure community safety. And uh, this includes parking enforcement um, officers that are used to assist with keeping the roadway clear in case fire needs to respond. Um, and additionally, uh, some points there looking for any flames or anything to report out. Um, staffing levels impact overtime consumption and reduced staffing tends to increase usage in order to maintain minimum staffing levels for both sworn and professional staff positions, including patrol teams, communication center, property room, crime scene unit, and the jail. Next slide. So current year expenditures, um, we still have a $2.3 million general fund overtime budget. Uh, council, council actions uh, resulted in a $600,000 reduction uh, directly to overtime. So that revised our authorized general fund overtime budget to down to $1.7 million. Uh, year to date actuals, which is only four pay, pay periods of overtime, are at $984,000, which is 56% of our allocation for the whole fiscal year. And uh, as you'll see in the notes, um, about $304,000 of the 984 is a result of the Napa County fires 
which will be reimbursable under FEMA, but still shows against our general fund, fund overtime budget. And um, so some of the challenges to reporting these uh, different overtime, right now we're in two different financial systems, fund, which is our legacy system, and IRMA, which is our new enterprise system. Um, it's a manual process. Um, I had to run uh, around 70 reports and compile and prepare the different expenditure reports to put into these files. Um, we're trying to explore adjustments in the new system for future reporting, but right now that's still under development and not, not likely to occur in the next few years. Final slides would be um, the next steps, since this is the first time providing this level of detail, looking for direction as to or suggestions, is there any additional information or data the council would find helpful, and was the format and data easily digestible? So with that, open for questions. Thank you. Um, so this is a lot of information to absorb at once, and um, it, it is actually quite relevant to the decision that we'll be making in November on the annual appropriations ordinance. So um, I'm just looking here. Um, I didn't see this in the actual report itself. So can we get the slide deck? Because yeah. this information is helpful to the council to have so as to consider any requests for additional funding for covering overtime. Yeah, I'm glad to provide you with the slide deck. I believe I already given to the clerk and um, also just want to acknowledge that this is, we recognize this is sort of the beginning of a conversation. Um, uh, we were asked to provide an update on overtime as part of this report. So yes. we worked to put that together, but I also want to acknowledge that uh, uh, there are probably more questions and more things to talk about than uh, time tonight, but we're happy to Thank give you I appreciate it. Madam City Manager, is this going to be presented to the budget committee? We can certainly make presentation to the budget committee. We wanted to come in November with this presentation, um, but we thought it would be important to get it to this council tonight. Um, there was a desire to have it brought tonight. There was a vote at the council to have it be part of this report. So I appreciate you following the express direction of the council. My request would be that this be presented to the budget and finance committee because it is relevant to the AO discussion. So, um, I want to make that request to the city manager and to the and to Councilor Drosty. Okay, Councilor, uh, two minutes. Clerk, can you set the clock? Mr. Mayor, is it possible to go to public comment? Um, you know, it's only two minutes per council member. Let's just go to let's do the council comments, and then we'll do public comment. Given the the number of raised hands, it's probably going to be one minute per speaker. Um, so, Councilmember Davila. Thank you. Um, thank you for the report. I have quite a few questions, which I won't get into all of them, but I was curious is um, with um, the overtime that's reimbursable, do you get reimbursed for the full amount? And where is that shown on the um, data that we, the financials? Is there, is there a line item? that offsets the, I don't think there is, offsets the overtime that's been, that is reimbursable so that it will lower the overtime amount? So what happens is when we receive the check, we deposit it into um, usually the patrol overtime because that's the most staff um, positions that we have. So the offset will go into the year, deposited into the year of that the checks received. So this is why we need to do uh, accrual basis accounting mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because it's not really offsetting the expense yes. and therefore it's projecting more or even less, who knows, but because it's not within the same time frame. 
Um, and then, so that's my question. Yeah, that was my question. And then I'm curious as to, um, like, it says for, I don't know, I had a lot of questions, but the, one of the things that you said, it was like for um, special events, it was 720% over, and that's yes. crazy. And then the training, I'm just curious as to, is it possible that training can occur during regular hours and not make it overtime? And how, I mean, so I just... Over, I'm sorry. The overtime is, so let's say I have to go to training, a mandatory training, not in my role, but as, as a member that would need somebody to fill their spot, the overtime is for that person filling the spot that the person in going to training is vacating. So for example, if we have seven police officers that are assigned to work the streets and perform beat duties, and one of those officers has to go to training, we have to bring someone in on overtime to fill the beat that they're vacating. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understand without the explanation, but thank you. But I'm Sorry. curious is if you can have regular people, like so you know that person is having training, why can't someone that's not gonna get involved in overtime fill that position instead of creating overtime? Schedule it. We don't have we don't have the overlay of staff. Yeah, but you know you're gonna be doing it. I mean needed for that. If I understand your question correctly. Yeah, that's, that's. It's, we don't have like a, um, I don't know, a group or a body of staff who are, who are uh, able to move around and backfill for absences like that. <clears throat> I'm just curious if that's quite, if that's, I think, I mean, I don't know, but it seems like there should be some way of doing that without creating all this $7 million over or $5 million over each time. Okay, thank you. I guess my time is exceeded. Thank you. Before I go to Councillor Harrison, I have one quick question, which is in the slide deck, you had talked about um, overtime related to the quote, George Floyd protests. Was that in yes. Berkeley or was that in Oakland? Oh. Oh, so we had. For us responding to Oakland's request for mutual aid, are we reimbursed for that? No. So we are paying, taxpayers of Berkeley are paying to go to Oakland to respond to a protest um, and that's, com that's coming out of our budget. Right, and just as all the people who came in 2017 to support our operations when we were dealing with these big uh, dem demonstrations here, uh, they did not get paid by us either. Okay. Thank you. The mutual aid is not. Councilor Harris, um, you are. Recommended. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I am, Unlike the other press report, I'm very disappointed the way this was presented. It was really clearly stated during our large meeting in July that this was going to be coming to us as part of the crime report. And now we get this slide presentation, which has got a lot of good information, but it's impossible to absorb all this. Also, I want to say that when you look at all of these categories, it is clear that regular overtime is the one that is running over 400 plus percent plus it's a larger share anyway. This is not an immutable thing. It is not just that the department, oh well, overtime happened. It's a management control function to control overtime. And I'm finding the tone of this presentation really disturbing, like there's nothing you can do about it. The point of presenting this is for you to look at how to start managing this. Filling positions has not resulted in significant decreases in overtime spending. The end of 17 staffing levels, levels were at a low 155 officers and the department spent $6.5 million. In December 2019, staffing had rebounded to 170 officers and the department still spent $6.2 million on overtime. They're about a million dollars higher now than the beginning of FY18 despite enjoying higher sworn staffing levels. I would also like to see the charts that show by event include a crosshatch with level of position, and I need to know more about the, the FLSA case that was mentioned. Um, again, those are management control issues. You can decide who's gonna appear at events. Finally, I wanna say that I'm a little concerned about the numbers about the spending 
on private um, facilities, tired officers are, are less effective officers. And if we are letting people work overtime when we need them ourselves, that is probably not the best use of our resources. So I would ask that we examine that a lot more carefully. And also I wanna go back to this mutual aid point that the chief, I mean the mayor just made. Um, I'm hoping that we will have a full report of this in the budget. I am really unsatisfied with this report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vice Mayor Hunt. Yeah, I largely um, join Council Member Harrison's um, comments. And um, yeah, I appreciate that it's the first time that we have it, but it's, it's pretty uh, shocking. Um, I don't understand why we are asked to budget a certain amount if the um, police are blowing through that amount every year, if there are costs that need to be budgeted, they ought to be in the budget. Um, I'm interested in knowing where the money is coming from to cover all this quote unquote unbudgeted overtime that is so regular that it's normal. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, uh, what are, what's the salary savings? that the department has had on in these years and where's that going i mean honestly it just it does feel like it's something that has become very routine and unexamined um just the fact that there was no simple way to get the report i understand that it's a great thing that we got it but my goodness this is a huge expense for the city why didn't the police department figure out a way to track this 15 20 years ago um, so I guess the whole thing uh, has me a little frustrated, but what I really, really would like to ask is that the budget committee essentially have this presentation again, and that they really, you know, drill down on all the questions you've heard from us. Um, I don't know, maybe council members can, can submit questions. I don't feel like we should, you know, spend too much more time on it tonight, but I also feel like there's a huge amount of information that we need. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. So um, I'd, I'd like to formally refer this to the budget committee and um, have them do an, a deep dive and maybe report back to the whole council. Um, I don't think we need a formal referral. Um, I want to confirm that this presentation can be provided to the budget committee. Mr. Mayor, I confirmed that we will bring this to the Budget and Finance Committee. Excellent. Thank you. All right, Council Mayor Kessler one uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and thank you for the uh, presentation on overtime. So the, the slide that I wanted to hone in on was towards the end about where we are in the current fiscal year. Um, you know, very alarming figures, right? 984,000 has already been spent over four pay periods. Uh, so to do that math, that's about 220,000 per pay period, and we have 22 more pay periods. So if we continue on that path, we will be looking at about 5.4 million of overtime this fiscal year. Um, can, can you s tell us how does that compare to actuals in prior years? And my apologies if that was in the presentation, I may have missed that. No, it wasn't in this presentation, but um, I think the previous budget presentation was in there. Um, so uh, fiscal year 20 was 7.6, fiscal year 19 was 6.3, fiscal year 18 was 6.4. Okay, thank you very much. So, so we are on pace to be similar to that. And so my question was about those four pay periods uh, leading to about a million of overtime. Is that, um, do you see any seasonality to this or or is it about the same every pay period? Well, I mean, if there's an, a scheduled event or an unscheduled event, that will spike the overtime. If If we have to have the whole, like the majority of the department work to support the operation for a large event, then that's that's a significant amount of overtime. Okay, so it, it just depends on the nature of the events. Right. Okay, this well, I do think that, you know, this is going to be some, oh, Chief, did you have something you wanted to add? No, we, we, we responded to the mutual aid call uh, for the fires. 
-hmm. just going back in our recent past here. <clears throat> so the mutual aid, for example, for those, these are cata you know, catastrophic level events. Uh, the mutual aid is not only asking for fire support, but also for law enforcement. So across the entire region, not just Alameda County, but agencies from uh, all of our neighboring agencies uh, responded to the mutual aid call for law enforcement mutual aid support, whether it was fires out uh, to the east uh, or up north or to the south. So uh, that was an impact. That's, a, that's an unscheduled event that happened in this, uh, you know, in this snapshot. And I think we'll be able to get um, more granular uh, when we present to the budget committee to uh, show this, including at least showing by, um, by hours give you a sense of, uh, of um, uh, unscheduled events, um, you know, scheduled events where over time is spent <clears throat> to support various operations, uh, just for example, for last year. So I'm hoping we'll give you uh, more information and more context. Okay, thank you very much. I, I do think that obviously we have to look at this and our entire budget. So it does make sense for this to go to the budget committee. Uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Robinson. Hey, Chuck. Thank you so much for the presentation. I, uh, I'm really glad this will be getting the uh, the scrutiny it uh, it needs. And it, you know, it sounds like it's it's really overdue that we we look at you know what feels like in many ways a, a, an almost sort of precarious situation we've allowed to be to be normalized. I'm sure it'll be easier when I when I have the report it, itself in front of me in a, a different format. I know a lot of the the visuals um, that we had in the presentation were very helpful to sort of paint the picture. Uh, and what's on my mind most is you know it's it's very difficult for me to conceptualize which of these overtime expenditures we could be doing a better job of forecasting and which are truly unpredictable factors. And so many of them, you know, for example, you know it's. It's hard to know when uh, when Milo Yiannopoulos will will come to town, and I, I can't fault us for not knowing when something is uh, going to happen like that. But you know the, the the holiday pay and some of the the trainings, you know, I have to assume. And of course, I, I don't know, I don't work in the departments. So maybe I don't know, but so many of these expenses seem like they could be things that we could be forecasting out better, and there's no good reason we shouldn't be budgeting accurately for uh, in the first place. So I um, I'll be I'll be as tuned into each of these budget committee meetings as I can. Uh, thank you for bringing this to us. Councilor Davila, before we go to public comment. Thank, whoops, thank you. Um, yeah, so that was one of my questions um, because I thought you said that holiday pay wasn't included. I mean, how could that not be part of the budget? Or, I mean, all these things should be in, in the budget, period. And then, you know, the overtime, like you showed us that um, sheet that allocated how the overtime was spent with the little boxes at the bottom. Now, is that going to be, um, is that input into Irma to, can you generate a report with that tells us like how those, the overtime is spent with the software that we have currently? I know the antiquated DOS program is antiquated, but now we have Irma and you said two or three years. I mean, that's, that's kind of ludicrous. Irma has been happening for quite some time now. So can you speak to that? So um, Irma is a new system, but payroll has not been, um, is in the process of being um, entered into Irma. So that, that process the development of it has started, but not the actual implementation of time being entered into Irma. So right now, everything that is related to payroll is done in funds, which is our legacy system. So that's why we have to run in two different systems. Non-payroll items are run in Irma currently. So we're straddling two systems. Um, there's, you know, the, state, the city's trying to convert different modules um, into Irma, but it's a few at a time and budgeting is in the process of being done in Irma, but right now we're still in funds for, for several of those components. So, so right, I, but at some straddling. point, all that those little boxes will be in Irma? 
I mean, that's the lo yeah, that's the long long range goal, and the short range goal is to move uh, multiple different uh, facets of the existing legacy system into Irma, and it's like we've done the first five. Um, categories of transition, but there's um, there's a lot more modules to implement. So it's a it's a piecemeal approach right now that we're trying to do the best we can. And then there's that miscellaneous expense that you said had twelve hundred dollars, twelve thousand, and it's a catch-all. But to me everything can be categorized. So I was curious as to what kind of things go into that. I'll pull some specific um, items for that and I'll, I'll provide that detail. I, okay, I'm not thanks. sure right off the, off the bat. All right, if you can present that to the budget committee, that would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay, thank you. Let's get a public comment.